Okay, I think we could uh, move on with our event. Thank you very much, Marina Chernyaska, our behind the scenes magician who is assisting me with this event today. Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Natalia Konenko Friesen. I'm connecting with you from the land of many indigenous peoples and Métis peoples from the town called Amiskwasi Waskahikan, also known as Edmonton, Treaty 6 territory. Today's event is hosted by the Kul Folklore Center in association with the Hutsulak Chair of Ukrainian Culture and Ethnography. We are recording this meeting. We are uh, going to make it available online as soon as it's ended. We do not have YouTube screening at the moment. And just a few more technical points before we move on is that those of you who have difficulty hearing us for whatever technical reasons, we are we made available live captioning for you. You just need to click on the CC live transcript button in the menu. Today's round table, the ethnography of the war, articulating research needs in times of unfolding trauma, is hosted uh, for, of course, very important reasons. Since February 24, 2022, Ukraine is under a state of war, having been under the attack from, uh, by Russian's uh, regime and being invaded by the Russian army on multiple fronts. Ukrainian ethnographers, oral historians, anthropologists, and folklorists, those still in Ukraine and elsewhere are facing multiple challenges. As individuals and members of their families, they try, try to survive and reorganize their personal lives in response to the Im immense pressures that Russia's war on Ukraine put them under. As scholars, they see the world around them and they interpret it through the prism of their trade. We have already seen the announcements of interview-based research projects aiming to capture the human experience of the war. We have seen anthropologists publicly sharing their preliminary findings and observations of what everyday culture and popular expression can look like in the context of the war. This scholarly work in ethnography and anthropology has traditionally been based on observing and engaging with people on the researcher's curiosity that requires focused examination of people's experiences in situ, whatever this in situ could be these days. What are the ethical implications of such so-called rapid response field work during sensitive times? Can we start articulating research needs in the time of still unfolding trauma? Sadly, these questions are not new to ask. In the field of anthropology, the war is a well-known topic of research. War is a persistent attribute of human cultures through times. These are the words with which, in 2014, a well-known anthropological museum, the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology at Harvard University, opened a five-year-long exhibit, Arts of War. And while the exhibit focused on the objects of past wars, mostly handcrafted weapons in particular, this scholarly statement, which I've just cited, reminds us also of the importance and validity of anthropological and ethnological perspectives on the study of war. But every time when the horror of war descends upon people, their families, their communities and societies, the experiences of the war are soaked in trauma, loss, and pain. Only a day ago, we have learned the utmost brutality with which hundreds of civilians, residents of Bucha, Irpin, Hostomol in the suburbs of Kyiv have been treated, raped, tortured, and executed under the brief occupation by the Russian troops. And that's only in that one example of what atrocities are currently being uh, pushed on Ukraine these days by the Russian army. In the field of anthropology of Eastern Europe, and this is the field with which many Ukrainian ethnographers identify, we have witnessed an entire generation of ethnographers and anthropologists working through the trauma of the Balkan War, for example, that plagued the region in former Yugoslavia throughout the 90s. And the question of how to conduct research ethically in conflict settings is also addressed in many other contexts concerning many other wars that continue to unfold around the world outside of Europe. 
Sadly, it is now an urgent question to address by scholars in Ukraine as well. We have three established ethnographers, anthropologists, and folklorists with us today who agreed to reflect on these and other questions of utmost importance for us all in the field. Let me briefly introduce our speakers. Uh, and this is going to be done in the alphabetical order. Dr. Marina Hrimich, welcome Marina. Dr. Hrimich is a folklorist, anthropologist, writer, and diplomat. She has been a professor at the Kyiv Shevchenko University since 2006, and a curator of academic projects at the National Center of Folk Culture, Ivan Honchar Museum. Since 2016, she has worked as an independent researcher in the Middle East. The other speaker today is Dr. Oksana Kis, Oksana Vitaimo. Oksana Kis is a feminist historian and anthropologist, a head of the Department of Social Anthropology and a leading research fellow at the Institute of Ethnology, National Academy of Sciences of Lviv, um, Sciences of Ukraine, sorry, in Lviv. Her current research focuses on everyday lives of the Ukrainian refugees in the displaced person camps in post-World War II Europe. And many other uh, topics of research we know Oksana had pursued before. Our third presenter is Dr. Oksana Kuzmenko, and Oksana Vitaimo Vastakosh is a philologist and folklorist and a leading research fellow at the Ethnology Institute, National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine as well. Her research interests include historical folklore, dynamics of folklore tradition, methods of conceptual analysis of verbal folklore text, and integral, integral interdisciplinary folklore studies. Welcome, dear presenters. Okay, coming back to the technical side of our working today, just another uh, of brief overview how we will work today. I will be moderating this event as a host, and our event is conceived as a conversation. So we will have it organized in three parts or two parts. The first part consists of questions which I will be asking, and the presenters will be offering their answers in the order of the questions asked. We do have three questions to address today. Altogether, the first part, the reflections of our presenters should last 45, 50 minutes altogether. And after that, we're opening up the floor to the conversation with all of you in the audiences. We have reserved one hour and a half to this event. So I think we will have about 30 plus minutes for the conversation with all. Um, and if need arises, I also will ask the presenters to take a couple of minutes to reflect and respond to each other's statements, so dear guests, if you feel like you have something to add, which was going to be said, please do so. And then uh, questions you can ask via the chat. So that's where you can type them and we'll see how things are going. We can also accommodate some questions probably via the raised hand, which you, I hope, know where to locate at the bottom right of your screen uh, in the Zoom window as well. So with that being said, thank you very much for joining us today. And let me now uh, voice the first question, which, uh, to, which is to be addressed in our room today. Question one, when is a good time to start field work in Ukraine today? Given the ongoing and growing trauma of war experiences, should we launch research projects now? Or should we be more patient and let history take its course first? What kinds of research questions can be asked in this fluid and painful moment of the war that continues to unfold? What kinds of research questions can wait? I will ask first Dr. Kies, Oksana Kies, then Marina Hrimich, you will be the next person, and Dr. Oksana Kuzmenko, I will then turn to you. Oksana Kies, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here and to discuss uh, um, uh, and to reflect on, on the extremely important topic of um, and the role and the place and the responsibility of a scholar um, doing research on an ongoing uh, military conflict, ongoing war, uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine. Now, um, after the initial dismay and confusion caused by Russian military aggression against Ukraine somehow faded out, many of us scholars in social studies and humanities 
felt actually a poignant urge to do something useful in terms of our public and professional duties. As responsible and active citizens, we do want to contribute effectively to our society's joint efforts to invest our energy towards the speedy victory of Ukraine. As trained scholars, we feel obliged to help our society to survive this destructive tragedy as a human collective. Everyone made his or her choice in what role to participate. Some joined the military forces, like Miroslav Borisenko, a historian and ethnologist from Kiev National University. Some had to take care of their dependents and became either internally displaced persons or refugees, uh, like Irina Hintenko, an ethnologist from Kiev who evacuated with her little daughter and uh, elderly mother to Poland, and many turned into volunteers and engaged in humanitarian initiatives of uh, all kinds, yet others have chosen to serve their, uh, our country by doing what they are trained to do the best, to research this war, its impact on the the various social groups, the people reactions to wartime trials and challenges in order to help to understand meaning of this historical event for various people. Since my scholarly identity is dual, combining feminist anthropology and history, or more specifically oral history, I will try to share my reflections from both perspectives. In both research areas, we do the field work, but the types of such activities, in fact, may differ substantially. In the context of an ongoing bloody war affecting millions of people, however, one has to be extremely careful and cautious in choosing appropriate research methods and tools. So before initiating any research project or engaging in any research activities, I would try to answer some basic questions to make sure that my efforts will lead to the goals I set, will bring the results I expect, will not be basically wasted and uh, what is more important will not uh, do any harm to anyone involved. Considering the, uh, the ongoing war situation, I think very carefully what kind of fieldwork would be most suitable and potentially productive, but at the same time, what types of fieldwork are really feasible and uh, less risk entailing for all the parties in given circumstances. For an anthropologist as well as for an oral historian, a human experience represents major focus of intellectual inquiry and any aspect of it may constitute great interest, uh, great research interest. In our case, uh, we are well aware that experiences of war in Ukraine are extremely diverse. Public and personal manifestations of those experiences and their cultural representations are even more versatile. This is not a regular war like any other in the past. So where should we start from in our research on human experiences of such an unprecedented historical event? How can we approach this terra incognita? And this is a defining point. We don't know this terrain. Despite all the previous training and professional experience, we have to admit that our knowledge in this specific event is rather limited and to the, a great extent biased due to our personal relation to it. And exactly because of uh, unpredictability of eventual outcomes of our research activities, no matter how noble or well-intended the research goals are, I'd prefer to stay on the safe ground. First, do no harm should be the primary rule, I guess. I'd suggest to guide and to evaluate all our decisions by a potential risk assessment for all the parties, thinking thoroughly about overall safety and security of our research subjects, their communities, and ourselves too. We just cannot foresee all the aftermath. We cannot even predict our own reactions to what could occur in the course of such a project exactly because we never had such an experience. We just have to be very cautious now if we don't want to unintentionally increase human suffering and loss. What we do know for sure is that a great share of Ukrainians are traumatized by this war in one way or another to greater or to less extent, virtually everyone is affected. And that the war continues now. 
Many of us oral historians do have experience of interviewing people who survived traumatic events long ago. The World War II, the Holodomor, the Holocaust, political repressions, Chernobyl nuclear disaster, and so on and so forth. The key difference here is time that elapsed after that event, the temporal distance from then to now. After decades passed, our narrators, if not work it through, those painful memories, at least they learned to live with them. Uh, and here I'd like to, uh, to, to offer a quote to cite a scholar, Jennifer Kramer, a director of the Center of Oral History at Louisiana State University Libraries in her recent article discussing controversies of doing oral history on the ongoing crisis, uh, she emphasized it. Uh, I quote, the experience of interviewing someone who recounts an integrated trauma contextualized within decades of a life narrative does not necessarily translate to an interviewer being qualified to conduct crisis-centered oral histories happening in the here and now when people have not had the chance to reflect upon and integrate traumas as they are actively experiencing. Ukrainians are, uh, who are directly affected by war had no chance to reflect upon or to make sense of what happening to them, to come to terms with their traumatic memories, because those experiences are not memories yet, since the war continues. What would be the goal of an oral history um, in our situation? I assume the goal could be twofold to document the human experiences of war on the one hand and to help people to cope with emotional burdens caused by those experiences as some advocates of such oral history projects claim. Well, one cannot deny importance of personal testimonies as valuable primary resources for a historical inquiry, but at the same time, oral historians know very well and here I quote Alessandro Portelli, that the first thing that makes oral history different is that it tells us less about events than about their meaning. But how can people who have just experienced a traumatic event ponder on their meaning? We all know that recent based event narratives are more fragmented and focus on the details of the how and the what whereas past-based events are more cohesive and looped into casual explanation, focusing on why. So what we actually get interviewing people in crisis is a detailed description of what happened to them, a chronology, chronography of emotionally charged fragmented facts. Is that really what we need to know right now, right away? Or is that knowledge worth the price our interviewees and we are going to pay engaging in such a risk entailing endeavor? Or let us be honest, are we doing this to document crimes and gather evidences or testimonials for a future trial, actually serving as self-nominated investigators? But then another question of qualification arises, arises. We are not trained for such jobs. And by the way, Irina Venediktova, prosecutor general of Ukraine, informed today that prosecutors all over Ukraine have been already ordered to interrogate the victims of atrocities to document Russian war crimes. Let them do their job. Once again, scholars doing oral histories of traumatic events uh, warn other oral historians that uh, should not be considered themselves healers, neither should we pretend to be investigators. We oral historians are merely not qualified to handle people in crisis. We are not prepared to deal with any possible manifestation of trauma in course of an interview. We've got no relevant knowledge in psychology, no appropriate skills and tools. That also means that exposing ourselves to those traumatic stories, we are not protected either. How much pain can one interviewer bear? How long one could listen to stories of suffering, loss, destruction, uh, and massacre. How could an interviewer manage all those emotional burden? After all, how quickly the interviewer will burn, burn out attempting to help others. That is why I, I, as an oral historian, would postpone any interviewing to much later until this war becomes part of our past, at least in chronological terms. This war has to be defined as history. 
It has to be literally over before it is suitable for historical analysis. As an anthropologist, however, I would approve some types of field research, which seems feasible, uh, insightful, relatively safe, and definitely less maleficent in terms of undesirable side effects. First and foremost, I welcome autoethnography as a self-exploratory and self-reflective ethnographic analytical practice for those who found themselves inside the war and are able to document their first head experiences and ponder of, on what they live through against the wider context. Autoethnography comes in the form of a diary or field notes or audio recorded comments or a video journal. Such examples already surfaced from uh, our colleagues in different disciplinary backgrounds uh, all over Ukraine, and I have a couple of examples. Besides of being valuable cultural text, I believe such testimonies are extremely insightful and thought-provoking primary sources to start with and to build up our future research projects. All kinds of digital ethnography are also most welcome, as long as it does not involve direct interaction with people. Internet is replete with all kinds of data and materials, textual, visual, and others, which could become a rich and extremely insightful sources for an anthropological research on current war and, and different groups' engagements with it. I would even welcome participant observation type of field research among those of our colleagues in social studies, including ethnographers, sociologists, or folklorists, or historians who happen to be personally involved in some kinds of group war-related activities. For instance, uh, Lilia Musihina, an ethnographer and an oral historian from Ternopil, is a soldier in Teroborona now. Our Hanna Zaremba Kosovic, a colleague of mine, a sociologist from our department, belongs to a group of volunteers who facilitate evacuation of people with disabilities abroad. Yet another colleague of mine, Mariana Baidak, a historian, took over responsibility for logistic in delivery of foreign humanitarian aid to Ukraine. These people are in a position to closely observe specific aspects of wartime uh, human experiences, activities, and behaviors from inside. And at the same time, they most likely enjoy much needed trust and have direct access to the potential interviewees if at some point they decide to push a full scale research project. So um, at this specific moment, I would definitely refrain from any personal interaction with people directly affect, affected by war for the purpose of interviewing or as a type of surveys. These people need therapy first. They need to put their lives together and to figure out how to live on. They may need to speak, to speak out their experiences and burdens to feel better, to rationalize what they lived through, but their talks are not to serve our goals, documenting war and creating public records of, his, of personal experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana, very much. I will ask Marina Hrimic to continue. Dear colleagues, thank you for the arranging this event. It is just in time discussion. All the important issues are correctly laid down in the title of the event and the topic is framed very accurately. Only one tiny objection, subject matter of war studies, including anthropological and folklore. It is not just trauma. General of uh, World War II, um, George, uh, Patton used to say, an army is a team. It lives, sleeps, eats, and fights, fights as a team. I used this quotation for the epigraph to my research book, Anthropology of War Case Study, Halicina Division. And I tried to keep my narrative in the frame of these key words, team, eat, sleep, fight, and additionally, learning to contest, surviving in the prisoners of war camps, etc. And now regarding your question, all of us, I mean, the folklorists and anthropologists, especially field workers, ethnographers are in severe need of getting answer on this question. On one hand, we are very anxious about what is going on around us in times of war, 
we are very sympathetic and empathetic all in one, but at the same time as professionals, and this is on another hand, we cannot but see the new research field unwrapped in front of us. We, uh, we faced a dilemma, either to wait until the war is over or to start working immediately. In this situation, every researcher has her or his own choice. I have read some comments of my colleagues in Facebook. Some of them are very angry about researchers, journalists, writers who are interviewing people suffered in war just now. I would repeat, it is your and only your choice. What about me? I'm not ready to do that. But I'm still sure that it is important to start just now. Why? Because it is a crucial chance to work not with an autobiographical memory as we used to, but with the episodic memory, which is much richer in details and image prints than autobiographical uh, one. In other words, we would deal with evidences, proofs, rather than with reconstructions and reinventions. Uh, re Since 1930s, when Sir Frederick Charles Ballet published his book, Remembering, a study in experimental and social psychology. The main, uh, we, uh, we are very careful with autobiographical memoirs. The main idea is, I would read uh, the quotation, uh, that memories of past uh, of past events and experiences are actually mental re reconstructions that are colored by cultural attitudes and personal habits rather than being uh, direct, uh, direct uh, recollections of observations made at the time. Since Sir Barlett, uh, for more than 90 years memory, um, since Sir Barlett, for more than 90 years, memory studies have demonstrated that uh, autobiographical memory, it is not about the past, but about ourselves now. There is enormous selectiveness of our memories. 80% of them are about the state of now. What about episodic memory? The experience of criminal investigations is a very vivid demonstration that operate, um, demonstrates that operative um, officers working at the scene of the crime knows the necessity of collecting witness accounts as soon as possible. Because a witness remembers um, an accident um, or crime uh, happened today, as fresh picture. It looks like a bulk of the story, uh, a bulk of un uh, unclassified details and like a mesh, but tomorrow he or she would present only a half of the story. In one week, it would be total failure. In one month, a witness presents a very logical, beautiful story and as Ballet says, she or he uh, confabulates details by adding to his own memories. Uh, regarding my book, Anthropology of War, 95% of interviewees, um, interviewees uh, conf confabulated what the German major Heinke wrote in his memoirs. It was the first published book which became, um, which, uh, became like a Bible for uh, former combatants, for Halicina division veterans. Many memoirs uh, look like uh, Bliznice Bratia, like brothers twins. Still, Autobiographical memory studies are very important, especially for those who work in the field of trauma studies. But what about those who study ethnography of extremal situations from the perspective of what George 
Patton said about anami, it is favorable and strongly re recommended to start research as soon as possible because war is not only a trauma, I repeat. It is, it is an everyday work of many people, volunteers, army officers, doctors, um, uh, policemen, uh, firefighters, and so on. For them, it is a work. In this respect, those who used to work with autobiographical memory can wait a little bit, but who prefer, prefers to deal with the episodic memory should start now. Thank you. A different angle. Thank you very much, Mariano. I would now kindly ask Oksana Kuzmenko to join the discussion. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Slava Ukraini. I agree with a lot of my colleagues' observation. I would also like to add that, in my view, a good time to start field work, as they say, is here and now, in the same way as it is there and later. The first months of the war has shown that the awareness of necessity of the ethnography and folkloristic fieldwork comes when the scholar gets over the shock state of the acceptance and realization that the war has begun. And only then are the first steps made in the direction, direction for some intake days, for other weeks. It mainly depends on the safety of the place where the researcher is staying and the free time available to team, them. Besides that, the person starts living a different life. There is no old peacetime routine, but a completely new chronotope, a harsh routine of a war zone with eye red alerts, sirens, and curfew. Therefore, obviously, now is not the time for planning project with the scholars who are staying in Ukraine. By virtue of my professional themes, which have always been related to the Ukrainian folklore of the First World War, the Second World War, and the folklore of the period of the Ukrainian Revolution of 1917-1923, I was aware of the importance for a philologist of being hot on the trail and recording early any samples of the creative work. Roughly, on the third day of the war, on my laptop, which I carried with me to the basement, that is my, my office, and I continue doing the song, I created a dedicated folder called War 2022 Folklore. Within the folder, I have divided the subgroups into genres. And I am trying to track the appearance of every piece of folklore seen on social network sites, sent to me by my friends or relatives or heard. Moreover, I ask my friends to pay personal attention and be responsive to the manifestations of folklore work. Currently, I am collaborating with five people who are regular or occasional voluntary reporters. They live in regions which are different in terms of the level of safety. Poltava, Odessa, Krakow, and Lviv. A similar thing was organized by a folklorist Volodymyr Hnatyuk during the times of the First World War. Hnatyuk presented his method methodological guidelines 
on the organization of field work already during the second year of the war in the article War and Fall Poetry. The article poses five additional questions for those who will record stories about war. Among the specific questions about soldiers' life in army, there are more general owns, which may be relevant even nowadays. For instance, what are the views on war, its causes and goals? What are what were a soldier's family going through? What was lacking? However, I think now is not the time yet for the question about death. Something, for example, has the soldier seen the death of his fellow soldiers? Or has the child seen the death of her mother? And what impression did make on him? Nonetheless, Natuk's idea of collecting war songs and stories remains relevant today. I fully agree with his thought that such collection will be of a special significance as it will express pupils' views on war, their attitude and response to it. When discussing almost every day war news with my fellow folklorists. We also often exchange thoughts about our future in science, about the post-point research themes and new livelihood, about refugees who are living in our house or the refugees that we are becoming. All these conversations are nothing but the acceptance and sharing the trauma that we feel and that we are trying to cope with. Since the first day of the war, the scholars who have remained here, in fact, in a split reality. On the one hand, they are going through their own experience of the war, on the other, doing research in the conditions of observation from the inside of the person in war. That is why everything from notice to scholarly reflections, subjective or objective, from the first day of the war and long after the victory, is worthy of the scholarly attention. Regarding other questions with, which can be asked in the times of an ongoing for war, I will give an answer based on my first-hand experience. I have recently started recording an interview with Irina, a 50-year-old woman who fled from, fled from Kharkiv. Irina has been living in my house since March 9. She is still full of hope to come back of her own home, which is very close to the area that can become a target of potential mis missile attack. Considering that, I am not going to ask her the question, when do you plan to return? From the first day of the war, Irina had to spend six days in a bomb shelter. Today, she can unmistakably tell the difference between previously unknown to her threatening sounds, automatic gunfire, sound on missile, a military jet over her head, an explosion one that is dangerously close and one that can be ignored. She arrived at our place in a terrible psychological state. She is gradually recovering, but she will not miss any irate siren, no matter when it sounds, and she is the first to go to the bomb shelter in the basement. What is more, at the grocery store, when something accidentally fell off the shelf, 
Irina was down on the floor in, in no time, as well as some other people who apparently have experienced heavy bombing. And that incident cannot be forgotten. It is worthy of the attention of anthropologists as well as a psychologist. I recorded Irina twice with a four day break in between. Each time after a heartfelt conversation, she thanked me sincerely and emotionally for the opportunity to share what she has been through. The question for the first session was a prophetic dream about which Irina started telling me when he had just met. The second recording I modeled by asking questions about her journey to Lviv. I was interested in what conditions she had left, being on the evacuation train, interaction between the people who were fleeing in panic to the west of Ukraine. This experience is important from the perspective of the comparative study of theme of links. However, it is also important to understand that for folklorists, the answer to a question is informative content has less weight than the chance of coming across folklore text in the answer. For this to happen, it is necessary to create as many opportunities as possible, ask as few questions as possible, and make them as generic as can be. This way, the respondent will choose by themselves what they want to tell you about within the general topic as war, of war. Thanks. Thank you, Oksana. Thank you, presenters. I'm gonna to go to the second question and we will continue on our conversation. Ukrainian folklorists and anthropologists these days are the insiders with firsthand experiences of the war. Others in nearby countries or afar are joining or waiting to join the Ukrainian researchers or so eager to bear witness to the birth of a new field of studies, it seems, that focuses on the war that has not ended yet and has not been assigned its historical name yet. Who has the right to engage in the ethnographic study of the war? Who doesn't and why? And can we even ask this question? Oksana Kuzmenko, we will start with you if that's okay. Yes. I am not sure that I am in a po position to determine who has the right and who does not have the right to research war. I presume that everyone does, unless they are doing it for propaganda, inspired by Russian propaganda justifying the war. It is another matter that the perspective always determines your view. And when I am talking about perspective, I mean most importantly, not theoretical premises, but real closeness to the war. What is more, I realize that the question is also about something else, a complex problem of choice for every Ukrainian researcher who is choosing between staying in Ukraine or living to be at the safe distance, going abroad to be able to ma maintain their academic status and scholarly level. The, the abundance of scholarship offered by various academic institutions of the European countries makes the mental crisis more intense and the struggle within the self becomes harder. Such opportunities have not been available before. I acknowledge that such support of our foreign fellow counterparts must be available 
because scientists from Kharkiv, Berdyansk, Mariupol, and Kyiv as well are not able to work under missile attacks. They are in a situation that can be defined as life on the edge of the world. For me, it is a different question. Will the scientists who have left be able to come up with themes for research that will be truly relevant? Will they be able to feel the pose of life in Ukraine? As what is important right now, to my mind, is a research that will in the long run work towards the future of Ukraine, which will need to be rebuilt after all the destruction caused by Russian invaders, stunning the world today. And I'm talking not only about the destruction of physical objects and facility, facilities, but also what is more important, people's broken lives. There are numerous other circumstances which present a challenge for those who do how to crowd, who to, how to carry all out ethnographic research. For instance, the practice of volunteering. A lot of my colleagues from the Ethnology Institute are involved in this kind of activity. Already during the first week of the war, Oksana, Kiss and I had to organize the logistic of the humanitarian aid cargo from Warsaw which was unloaded to the shed in my yard. Searching for volunteers, delegating duties, prioritizing requests, there were a lot of those in the first days. Tracking and overseeing the sand cargo, looking after the women who from early morning for almost six hours in winter cold were sorting out various food stuff, toilet, toiletries, clothes, medis, medications, all that was news to me. It was a huge personal experience of unity, solidarity, trust, and understanding in a situation where every one of us had left their comfortable workplace at the desk and did what was really needed instead. We were learning to work in organized manner, dispassionately, despite the wailing sirens. I now have a list of acquaintances who are volunteering at the Ukrainian Catholic University, at the Lviv Court Station, work to the, to hazard, together with the medical crews and territorial defense of Kiev and Nizhny, or have been helping military bases since the very beginning of the Russia-Ukraine war in 2014, who are very familiar, familiar with all the dangers of the war on the front line. I think that every day life in Ukraine brings new themes and new challenges. For instance, cohabitation of Galicians in one flat with the people from eastern part of Ukraine is a separate theme for comprehensive anthropological research on the lesson of tolerance, cross-cultural differences, borderland identities, and love. And in conclusion about love, I would like, do you see? I would like to show you a wonderful applique work which was made a given to me as a gift by a five-year-old Alexandra from Kiev. At first, she fled, fled to Cherkasse with her parents, but now she's living at my peace. This piece of work 
is very eloquent as it, as it expresses the subconscious desire of the girl to return to her own home. The child's work contains a visual, visualization of one of the ultimate folklore concepts of the Ukrainian culture, the concept of home, which I have described in my monograph. What will our common home be in a day, in a month, in a year? This is a question which today, unfortunately, no one can answer yet. Thanks. Thank you, Oksana. Thank you. Marino? Uh, um, Regarding to the second question, I would say that no matter what we believe in about who has a moral right to engage in the ethnographic study, it has already started and we are not eligible to either allow it or forbid. I'm not sure about your Facebook timeline, but mine is overflow with posts written by psychologists, writers, journalists, folklorists, containing what we can call is the ethnographic in case it is de, uh, diary or self recordings or meta ethnographic sources. And some of them are pretty good until we don't have an opportunity or bravery to, to work uh, at the traditional field as insiders of army, terroborona, volunteers, displaced persons, medical personnel. We can work with internet uh, sources. A week ago to my former students, as Natalka mentioned, and now colleagues, uh, Tina Pollock and uh, Julia Buski presented their research sketches. Inside his experience of being displaced, Julia, and classification of first ethnographic field uh, trophies, Tina. Uh, another ethnologist, Irina Batereva from uh, Vinnytsia, she is consistent, uh, consistently reposted in all the Facebook memes, no matter if they are ingenious stuff or just, uh, just crap. Uh, primarily, I was unhappily surprised about all this uh, Facebook garbage on her timeline. But finally, I get to understand it. She uses her Facebook page for archiving Facebook sources. As I mentioned before, some Facebook users keep diaries. My favorite uh, are biologist Ivan Rusia from Tuzliski Liman, a Zapovidnik, and uh, Yevhen Kiosia, zoologist spending last month at Kharkiv. Uh, hashtag Zhitya Boblozi. Uh, Mariana Dush, uh, Dushar, a very important researcher of Ukrainian cuisine, collects stories about food waste in times of war. Yulia Stachivska uh, writes Shchodenik Vinny. The site Pen Ukraine presents diaries uh, by the writers Anastasia Lepkova, uh, Artem Chapai, Larissa Denisenko, Bogdana. Romansova, Oleg Kotserev. For example, Anastasia Levkova uh, quoted an uh, interview uh, of uh, one guy. Moje prizvishe Bayraktar, z perskoi praporonosic. Mi tato irakec, mama ukrajinskoi ta rosijskoi krovi. Mi tato teka vid vini, narešče upenilse v Ukrajini. Oh, story, wonderful story. Um, wonderful in terms of uh, in terms of our uh, science, but in terms of uh, humanitarian crisis, it is not um, like a good experience. Artem Chapai writes Chudeniki Provini. Larissa Denisenko publishes every day. Uh, I quote, Duje Обережні нотатки про особливості життя в Києві. Жанна Куява, also writer, uh, witnessing her experience escaping from Irpin. Богдана Романцова, also 
uh, uh, writes her uh, everyday notes and as a volunteer and uh, she writes розповім історію одного біженця яку все не наважувалися переповідати uh, but she does it and I think that in future it would be very interesting materials of her diaries. Uh, and even ordinary individuals share their war experience in everyday notes, which start with the words uh, eighth day, 20th day, 22nd day of war, 34th day of war, and so on and so on. As, for example, Ksenia Minina, uh, a teacher from Volnavaha. Uh, and uh, her logo, how to say, uh, okay, logo, так? Російська армія бомбить всіх і мертвих, і живих, і ненароджених. Uh, okay, therefore, as long as we cannot work in traditional field, I mean, those who cannot work on traditional field, we can do our fieldwork job using internet resources. And what about ethic issues around traditional fieldwork? Uh, I am sure that many civilians who escaped from the belly of hell are in need of sharing their experience, telling, speaking, articulating their trauma. And speaking process has a psychotherapeutic effect. I think they want to share their extreme, terrible, death-like experience and then, and then finally forget about it. We know this peculiarity of the human memory. For many years, people don't want to speak about traumatic things happened in their lives. But when, after many years, they came up with decision to tell their stories, they are not extracting their memories from the memory device, which is called our brain. They construct them. Several generations of experimental psychologists during almost 100 years proved that. And, and second, I would repeat again, sorry for, for that. There are many people, professionals involved in war. Why do we exclude them from our research? They have the same right to be interviewed as uh, the same as victims uh, right victims of war for them i mean for professionals war it is a hard work and everyday life in extreme conditions дякую за увагу на це питання дякую марина оксана кіс будь ласка uh, okay, thank you. Uh, this time I'll be much shorter in my comments. Uh, first of all, I am very far from an idea that Ukrainians or Ukrainian scholars should have any priority in defining the research field or initiating research projects on this war only on the basis of our first hand experiences, which are very diverse, by the way. I would even assume that in some cases, those of us who were directly affected and traumatized by war won't be able to personally engage in any ethnographic study for a while. They need to heal their wounds first. I don't think anyone has an exclusive moral if you wish right to launch or join any research project on this war. My only criteria is his or her professional competence in a specific discipline, be it anthropology, sociology, folklore studies, history, cultural studies, psychology, you name it, combined with a substantial background knowledge necessary to adequate ad understanding of uh, the wider historical, political, and cultural context. 
There is uh, one concern, however, I'd like to share. Uh, one of undesirable byproducts of such new and hot research fields is its attractiveness for all kinds of indecent research entrepreneurs eager to capitalize on the popular topics without having sufficient, if any, relevant expertise and with minimal efforts invested. We have observed this phenomenon during and after the Maidan and a number of rather superficial and empirically poor articles offering all kinds of far-fetched interpretations of our revolution popped up in academic outlets. This happened because some self-nominated experts on Ukraine, many of whom don't speak even Ukrainian, so they can't read essential primary sources, never bothered to come to Ukraine for a field research, but used ready available scraps of information or just focused on a certain vivid phenomenon taken out of context to build up their articrafty theories. I'm afraid we'll, uh, we will witness such an on rush again and most likely on a much bigger scale. I am afraid academic publishing houses uh, partially instigate such bad practice by trying to quickly satisfy high demand on respective knowledge and urging scholars to submit their uh, raw uh, manuscripts prematurely. We all know that uh, rigorous, well-grounded and thorough research requires uh, more time than just a few months. So to summarize, each and every expert in any field is welcome to explore human experiences, humanitarian implications, war crimes, cultural representations, and any other dimension of this war as long as he or she is equipped with relevant professional knowledge, research skills, and tools for a comprehensive, in-depth ethnographic inquiry. Uh, but there is only one real taboo for me, and this is definitely about a moral choice. No Russian scholar, a citizen of the Russian Federation should be allowed to this research field, never. No exception. And I don't have to explain why. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana. Thank you, Marina. And uh, again, Oksana, uh, these were not easy questions to address, but the last one we're moving on to is a bit more practical. Hopefully, it will be uh, an opportunity to, again, reflect on some other directions here. All three of you, my dear colleagues, uh, have done ethnographic work, of course, as you've uh, mentioned, on in, in the intersections of uh, the intersections of folklore, anthropology, ethnography, memory, also trauma. Given your past research findings and uh, reflecting back on, you know, episodic versus autobiographical memory research-based activities. What should ethnographers and anthropologists be focusing on today in their effort to document the human experience of this war? And more specifically, what could be those pressing research needs that you see right now emerging there that should be pursued right now? Um, Oksana Kies, we will start with you this time. Thank you. Okay, my answer to these questions uh, will be twofold. It consists of what uh, we as an academic community, anthropologists, ethnographers, folklorists, sociologists can do now when the war goes on, on the one hand, and what topics I as a feminist anthropologist consider to be important to explore in general, on the other hand. So we all are aware that Russian war on Ukraine is an extremely complex and really unprecedented event in all possible terms. That is why neither of us uh, not, uh, Ukrainian scholars nor Western researchers have any research toolkit ready to use right away. We don't have some uh, we do have some expertise in different areas. We do have some knowledge on certain subjects. We do have professional skills and practical research experience, but we never applied any of those in a similar context yet. So we don't uh, know what would be actually helpful, what would be useless, and most important, what could be harmful. That is why my personal stance is do not rush into sharing, uh, into starting any research uh, project right now. While uh, the war unfolds, uh, we have to get ourselves ready for future full-scale research projects, 
And first and foremost, we have to observe closely the events and to catalog all the dimensions, manifestations, representations of wartime experiences from the military actions and actual uh, battlefront in Ukraine, all the way to humanitarian activities and public protest all over the globe with special attention to gender, age, regional, social, including ethnic, professional, confessional, and other peculiarities of each group. We need to make sure no aspect of the war slips out of attention in our future research. Second, we need to document, to collect, to accumulate all types of potential primary sources that are available or come across during the war. Here I rely mostly on digital ethnography and I support Marina for that matter, social media monitoring and personal contacts with those who could potentially become our resource persons. I mean all kinds of wartime folklore, as Oksana said, cartoons, memes, amateurish poetry, protest arts, online diaries circulating in the internet. I also urge scholars to encourage people who are directly engaged in some kinds of activities to preserve or to document evidence as they are um, uh, that are not accessible for us. For instance, Irina Daniluk from Lviv, who is actively engaged in procuring and um, delivering some life-saving munition for military, is taking picture of drawing made by small kids to be added to each care package sent to, to the battlefront. Those, uh, those uh, drawings, they, uh, they will disappear, they go out, but she is, the, is making photocopies of them. And uh, those could become a valuable source for studying children's perception of war, for instance. Third, we definitely need to increase our institutional capacity to be well prepared and able to conduct high quality, comprehensive ethnographic research once the situation allows. We all are aware of our current limitations and shortages, but we could overcome them if we combine our expertise, resources, and disciplinary perspectives now to start searching for best practices, solutions, options. Our joint effort could turn into a synergy that allows to cope with challenges that uh, such an inquiry, inquiry could entail. And my last but not least point, uh, on a personal level, we need to work hard to ex uh, on expanding our knowledge, improving our skills, developing our and adjusting our research tools to equip ourselves in all possible terms for doing a research with a due professional responsibility, awareness, and integrity later on. And now the to, uh, to the topics which I, as a feminist anthropologist and historian of women, consider important to address. Of course, I find research on gender dimensions and gender peculiarities of human experiences of war to be of paramount significance. We know that too often war history is tended to neglect, omit, silence, or depreciate women's wartime roles and experiences under pretext of being minor, insignificant, auxiliary, or basically irrelevant. This, this should not happen now. We are well aware that on a large scale, male and female experiences of war might differ substantially, but none can be discarded as irrelevant if we want to understand the impact of this war onto our society at large and to reveal the sources and mechanism of our common victory. We need to take women into account, all of them in different spheres, in different roles, from those who are heroes to, up to those uh, who um, betrayed their fatherland. I would caution scholars from ascribing any special priority to some topics as seemingly more pressing or more significant, heroic, noble, worthwhile, and neglecting others as seemingly minor, uh, uh, and unimportant. I want each and every woman, woman's experience to be examined and taken into account to make the general picture of this war as complete and accurate as possible. And to see, acknowledge, and appreciate women's special, albeit different contributions to our cause. I encourage scholars doing research on women's experiences of war to go beyond stereotypical perceptions of women as mainly victims, oftentimes martyrs, and occasionally traitors. It is really important to pay attention to women's agency at different levels and in different, different uh, possible forms. 
I personally would be much interested in learning uh, of women's micro level care work and emotional labor. Usually scholars tend to focus on large scale events, institutionalized activities or some vivid phenomena, while individual activities and efforts that take place in informal settings too often go unnoticed and unappreciated. I mean women helping others on individual basis, either providing accommodation in their private apartments or taking care of a refugee family with special uh, needs or patronizing cer certain person in need. Um, there are numerous stories of women consoling and cheering up distressed strangers in evacuation trains, in bomb shelters, in hospitals or elsewhere. Many of us observed and experienced the working of women's informal networks when someone asked for help and the entire network has been activated to find solution because everyone matters. Each person has to be comforted. And these uh, women render their personal resources to help one or two individuals in trouble instead of engaging in large scale, scale social activism. Their efforts are barely visible, cannot be calculated or measured, but these kind of care work and emotional labor are essential for, uh, for our society to efficiently cope with hardships and challenges of war. All those manifestations of social solidarity represent in fact, women's grassroots wartime agency to be explored from an anthropological perspective along with other relevant topics. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana. Thank you very much. Marina, what is your take on this question? Okay, in order to visualize my answer for this uh, third question, I have prepared a table. It is not perfect but it would help me to put together all my uh, thoughts. Uh, so now I'll try to share uh, my, uh, uh, you see, ah, Ramadan Karim, the third day of Ramadan. Я вітаю вас всіх. Зараз, одну секундочку, знайду цю мою табличку. Uh, see my table, yes? Ah, oi, ozvite, будь ласка. Oh, yeah, ah? I can see my screen. Do you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can see the table. We have a bit of a poor connection. That's okay. Right now. Uh, you table. see my screen? Now, if you scroll it up a little bit. Так. Я тут, так, я тут цей. Рамадан, але для вас тут живають українки, які живуть в арабських країнах. Дотримуватися Рамадану, вони називають Рамаданити. Так от. It was in Ukrainian. Let's move together through this table, uh, but not horizontally, no, 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 horizontally, but firstly, vertically, okay? Starting with the columns and not rows. And well, the easiest way to start ethnographical research is to define the target group. The group of people we work with. In my table, they are listed in the first pink column, army, all the divisions and subdivisions, police, rescuers and firefighters, territorial defense, medical personnel, different kinds military doctors, officers, physicians, surgeons, pediatricians, nurses, field medication, volunteers as angels, uh, uh, as well as situational organizations. Then priests, imams, army uh, chaplains, then displaced persons, abroad and within Ukraine, then very important, administration, public sector or employees, railway, uh, uh, railway personnel, drivers, power station workers, utility service, diplomats, bloggers, vloggers, Facebook and Telegram users, hackers, journalists, 
as studio live journalists, uh, as well as war reporters and photographers. Then also gender and age uh, approach, uh, women, men, children, seniors, and even animals. Uh, it could be a very interesting research, animals at war. Then the next point and next column is uh, the gray one. Uh, sorry, one, one moment. Uh, it contains only four items of what, in general, we should focus on. Uh, after we have chosen a group of people we want to work with, it is the time to mark out what we are interested in. Either behavior, material, culture, speech, beliefs, or all in one. Then essential marker in the situation with Russian war in Ukraine is geographical one. Look at the green column. It does matter where you conduct your research. Either you take an in, uh, inventory of army material culture in the scenes of fighting or in the joint forces operation zone. Or you, or you are collecting um, territorial defense soldiers in Kiev. You can communicate to military or children's doctors in Kharkiv. In Kharkiv, Mariupol. Okay. Um, or investigate everyday life of people in the sites being in blockade like Kherson and Mariupol. Cities in blockade, like Mariupol. Then also, for example, when we uh, volunteering is pretty much the same in different locations. And you may not focus your attention on region where some activities took place, but sometimes it matters. For example, is it, it is a secure zone or unsecure? What else about geography and locations? Or oh, uh, displaced persons abroad, uh, it does matter where they are in Poland or France, in Europe or North America. Uh, my son is volunteering in France as a translator for displaced persons. And they expressed their um, they were not happy. They said that in uh, Poland, they were treated much, much better than in France. So it does matter in what country you are conducting uh, your research. And then we will go to my, in, uh, to my uh, favorite topic, diplomat. Uh, diplomats at war and your research in Europe, or like me in Middle East, uh, where uh, is Ukrainian, I'm going to say that communicated to uh, Arab uh, politicians, uh, uh, it's very uh, uneasy work. Then what we have, uh, for example, uh -huh, and at, at last, Mariupol, Kherson, Ochtirka, Chernobyl, Irpin, Bucha, Hostomel, Izum. They. Zaras, um, sekundochku. Should be um, picked out as a separate topics for research. For example, war in Mariupol could be pronounced as a, a 
particular separate uh, investigation or research. And the last column is, uh, which did say blue one? Ah, no, it is a white column. Uh, I put it, it's white, practically blank, up to your discretion. So it's about fields, methods, instruments of research, because uh, we have different views on this topic, so I skip it. And the last one, possible research projects. Okay, it's blue one. And uh, I will start with uh, where do I uh, where I have an experience. The simplest as for me, ethnographic research could be performed on the basis of what I mentioned at the beginning of our workshop. I mean the George Patton's quotation about an army which lives, sleeps, eats, and fights as, as a team. According to our first pink column, we can deal with uh, we can deal with or communicate to such teams as army, police, volunteers, medical service personnel, partisani, uh, guerrilla warriors, victims, prisoners of war, and so on. We can observe them, study, interview, describe, and analyze from the perspective of how they eat, sleep, fight, and work, including survival practices in the conditions of occupation and blockade. It is good to know what those categories of people believe in. Um, so I put some icons, not to repeat uh, words. You see, uh, police also, how do they uh, uh, fulfill their everyday duties? Okay, why should okay, yeah, sorry. Everyday life of clinics and hospitals in conditions of war, death and birth at war, for example, uh, we can uh, we can learn more about it. Talk uh, then about uh, resistant movement, survival practices, life in the bomb shelters. Okay, and this is the religion topics: believers and atheists at war, faith, beliefs, and disbeliefs at war. Interesting topic. Okay. And now I will scroll at the diplomatic front, anthropology of diplomatic life in the conditions of war. And what about internet folklore? Uh, so bloggers, bloggers and uh, uh, Facebook and Telegram users, uh, they present interesting um, insights and we can Collect internet folklore, men's diaries, trauma narratives, uh, VS, uh, the good soldier Schweik narrative. You know this uh, novel by Czech uh, writer um, Yaroslav Hasek uh, about the World War I, the, the Second World War. And so it is interesting point. So some of soldiers. They present their stories in, hum uh, in like a humoristic, uh, yes, and ironical and sarcastic. And so it is interesting topic for research, trauma narrative, BS, the good soldier Schweik narrative. And also it is very important to, uh, to research, to, to uh, study hate speech and image of enemy and image of hero in uh, uh, internet folklore or just new folklore. Okay, and of course, we are more than anyone can handle gender studies. We have so powerful team, Oksana, it's about you and your colleagues. And I would just propose to enrich them with age studies perspective. Okay, as for me, we are totally ready. We are totally ready. 
people when you move them in the budget attack. We are totally ready to create a multidisciplinary research team in order to commence a big research project. I'm optimistic. In, uh, I'm optimistic. Thank you. Thank you, Marino. Uh, dear attendee, attendees and participants in this event, we do have a bit of time, very little time left. We might have fewer questions addressed from the audience, but we do have Oksana Kuzmenko, who uh, I would like to hear what you have to say. Can we still spend 10 more minutes, uh, presenters, in this session? No. Marino, Oksana? Uh, yeah. The, uh... Super. And those with us in the audience, thank you for sticking around. This is such an important topic. We would like to cover it. So, and Oksana Kuzmenko, Prosh. Thank you. I will be talking about what I know best about the war folklore, uh, about uh, themes which we are uh, hearing about from uh, speech uh, Marina Hrimut. Folk art of the first phase of the current Russia-Ukrainian war is a powerful way of the new verbal, as well as verbal and visual text of various genres. Among them, the most dynamic groups of genres, sayings and neologisms, slogans and internet memes, anecdotes and humorous spells, satirical monostrophes, prayers, author poetry, often anonymous, narratives about prophetic dreams, memories about the bombing experiences, about flings, about the journey of the flings, about the orphans. These are the texts I would recommend paying attention to. Anthropologics and culturologics, as I can see, are interested in visual form of expression only. Posters, caricatures, cartoons, stickers, which may include inscription of folkloric character. Thus, those materials can be used for interdisciplinary research as well. A striking outburst of creative activity of people of various social layers and from different regions of Ukraine is indicative of deeply rooted Ukrainian folkloric tradition and its unique potential power, in particular, in the area of historical military folklore. It also evidently one of the most constructive method of overcoming the trauma of the Ukrainian society by ridiculing evil of sharing the new experience of fear, pain, and hate after two days ago. Emotional strain accumulates in thoughts and dreams. Irina from Kharkiv, whom I have mentioned as my first inform informer, saw a prophetic dream the day before. What is important for me is not only the fact of the dream. A prophetic dream is a completely traditional phenomenon. But what is essential is the system of imagery of the dream. In the dream, there is a large, bright house, white red flowers, shadow like people, and blood the most typical image for the Ukrainian oral tradition of interpreting dreams about war. The image is intensified by the visual component, the symbols of red color, which are related to the symbols of Bolshevism and people's associations with a looming war, such as red sky, and red clouds. Irina also mentions that she saw people carrying red meat in their hands. In 2009, in English version of the book called 
Stories of the Soviet experience, memoirs, diaries, dreams, came out, written by Irina Popernov, an immigrant from the USA. The author claims that historical anthropology uses stories about dreams as a valuable source of material, especially for study, studying terror. This study was mentioned by Tatiana Shevchuk, a Ukrainian folklorist, the initiator and co-author, along with Yarena Stavitska, of the studies of the peculiarities of functioning of the Ukrainian tradition of interpreting dreams at the beginning of the 20th century. Let me remind you that those times were very similar to nowadays. They were the times of the First World War, Revolution, and several Ukrainian national liber liberation uh, movements. Uh, in the main, on the desk. By the way, the collected works were published five years ago by Dolibe Publishing House. At the present time, the scholar had to flee from Kyiv to be safe from bombing. The collection of work contained texts which were recorded in 1920s, mainly from the Ukrainian undereducated peasant women from Zhitomer, women from Zhitomer and Khmelnytsky regions. Now we can study the semantic parallels with the text which can be recorded from the city people, such as my recording of women with high education in engineering. I have another voice recording of a prophetic dream from a woman whose family come from and now remain in Kherson region, in Holopristin, which is currently occupied by Russians. In the woman's dream, which she saw on the night from 21 to 22 February, there is an image of dirty, earthy chlorid conca river, a tributary of Dnipro. In the river, people swam. Near the river, there were three icons covered with glass. One sheet of glass was cracked. In 2015, a young folklorist Darian Cebor defending a thesis, paradigm of honoric folklore. The study was the first to analyze the peculiar, peculiarities of contemporary honoric folklore, in particular dream about Putin and anti-terrorist operation. The thesis actually mimics the research in initiative of German researcher Charlotte Berendt, who in 1933, when Hitler came to power, recorded 300 dreams which not only reflected the symbols of terror, but also, according to Reinhard Kozelik, became an anthropological gauge of the effect of terror. Another layer of folklore which is worthy of attention is sat satire and humor. From the first day of the war, various texts of humorous and satirical nature appeared on the internet. Short sentences with a rhetorical question to make a point, mini dialogues de depicting common problems of the first day, stay, flee for safety from one's own home, or join territorial defense and learn to defend oneself by all means available. And the last days we see about new dark jokes about enemy who in red forest. Subsequently, there appear jokes about the foolishness of the enemy. They wish nature of the ethnic stereotype of a Russian which shows 
in the similarity of the image of the Russian army to the Hitler army. Like in the phrase, for example, why is the Russian Nazi Z only half of Hitler's swastika? Or that because, as usual, the other half got stolen. The key content element in every piece of text is the optimistic energy of Ukrainians and the trope of nationwide armed defense. The new samples of folklore show the people's wisdom at the core of which lies the experience of many questions of Ukrainian peasants who by all means available, even with a high fork, defending their long-suffering land from aggressors, including the Ru Russian invaders. The modern age historical folklore has formed on the basis of a few potent war experiences of fighting with the enemy Moscow's siege riflemen during the First World War, the Ukrainian Revolution, and peasant uprisings headed by chieftains, and Second World War, which led to the National Liberation War of the Ukraine in Shurgan's army in 1940s, 1960s. It was the tradition of the Rebbe folklore that drew increasing attention to the image Uncommoned Banderits, who hide a machine gun in his vegetable garden in case it was needed in the future. Here is an example of another joke to end with. Neighbor, are you going to flee? Where would I flee? I got chickens, pigs, a garden, hay fog, and machine gun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oksana, Marino and Oksana. We uh, knew we are entering a very challenging territory. We knew the discussion will be um, complex and requiring much attention from the presenters, but also from those in the audience as well. I wanted to thank you, the presenters, for in fact, giving your utmost attention to these very challenging questions. And I want to thank the audience for being patient with us and the technology which slowed us down a little bit. Uh, the Cool Folklore Center has served us as a podium for, if you wish, safe dialogue uh, for uh, a conversation which may contain different opinions and may contain different messages. We had had some questions from the audience and I'm, I am uh, asking everybody for another three minutes to go through a couple of those comments. Myself personally, I obviously have very many questions to our presenters, but I may need to save those questions for the next opportunity because we are short on time. The first comment I'd like to refer to is an acknowledgement that the references to the stories that are nowadays circulating about the fleeing, about the, the journey of leaving Ukraine are of importance to study. Uh, a comment says, I've heard numerous from some of my friends who evacuated from their homes either to the west of Ukraine or a neighboring country, something like, it was such a trip of so many days on the way and so many hours on the board. It could be a book just based on that. So, this uh, commentator said, supports the idea for those ethnographers and anthropologists who started a planning to start collecting these stories while they are fresh and uh, while people are, people are eager to share them. The other comment I wanted to share with you also comes from the audience, of course, but it's a comment and a question and I would like that to be voiced. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask, though I, though I agree with you, Oksana, that more time is needed you suggest that researchers should collect material already, observe and make notes, prepare for the future research. I believe this is already research, which is work, and it needs to be paid. So what would you say about research funding for scholars in Ukraine right now during that period when empirical study might not yet be possible or advised? Can research projects start now and be time flexible, but provide support? Can, you know, can, can, you know, can there be support for this kinds of work? And it's also a question in some ways uh, which can be readdressed to someone like myself 
and my colleagues in Canada where we are privileged to have some funding in support of that research. But I will open it up to, to the answers here. And this, I think it might be the only question we can take here, given the time limitations. Research, is it work? Can it be supported? And should it be supported or paid? Um, can we start it, yeah. Yeah, thank you for this question. It is important indeed. Um, I believe that all, all of us or those of us who are uh, brave enough to start engaging in any research work related to, to wartime experiences are doing exactly what the entire Ukrainian population, all the citizens are doing now. They volunteer to do research at this very moment. So if some other people are volunteering in uh, um, fundraising for, the, for to support the army, the others are volunteering to assist the, the refugees, uh, some scholars could volunteer to, to begin the, this uh, primary uh, um, uh, research work to collect materials and to figure out what topics and in what ways could be approach it and, and research it later on. Uh, I am afraid that there uh, will be substantial budget cuts uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the money uh, were already in shortage for the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. Uh, and I am afraid we will uh, witness even further budget cuts. So it, it would be difficult to rely upon, uh, upon the state support. Uh, for such projects. So the only uh, possibility would be, as I said before, to, to launch the joint project with uh, Western institutions, with scholars from abroad who are interested and who are um, uh, competent enough to, to do something about Ukraine and who would, would support uh, Ukrainian scholars uh, with uh, some uh, uh, financial, uh, like, scholarships or whatever. So at this very moment, if somebody wants to start, he or she would start as a, as a volunteer at this moment. Thank you very much, Oksana. Anybody else from the panelists, from amongst the panelists? I completely support Oksana, her thought, because uh, we uh, live in this moment in Ukraine and uh, we view on uh, these uh, events uh, one eyes. Thank you very much. I will take the liberty to, uh, well, I have, as I said, I have many questions, uh, but just a question, very practical one to Marina, Oksana and Oksana. Obviously, this is a very important conversation. Obviously, those of us who are on Facebook Strichkas, we follow uh, many discussions and dialogues. What is next? Where are you heading next with uh, messages you have to right now, which you've developed and that can be shared further uh, with broader audiences outside of Ukraine in other professional settings of anthropologists, ethnographers, and folklorists? Where are you, where are you heading with that? Any other presentations scheduled up where we can go and follow up on what you're doing? <laughs> That's a difficult question. As I, as I said, you know, I am extremely cautious in engaging in any research uh, related to what I'm experiencing in Ukraine now. So uh, uh, I am trying to, to come back to intellectual work at this moment. It's difficult to focus on any research whatsoever. It's difficult to read books. Uh, you know, because uh, all the thoughts are about the current events, uh, and especially when uh, the terrible events like like the toes we learned uh, yesterday about Bucha massacre and all those atrocities. It's extremely, uh, you know, difficult to uh, distract yourself and to uh, to do something completely different. So I, I I am not prepared to do anything related to the war right away. You know, right now I I was barely able to put together some thoughts to to speak out today. But um, and Marina I believe said the same. It was difficult to focus uh, and, and to prepare for our today's conversation. No matter how important this conversation, this discussion and the issues raised are. So uh, 
Uh, I was invited to speak at different um, uh, outlets, uh, mainly about my previous research. It's uh, easier to, uh, to discuss. And there are many parallels, by the way, when uh, it comes to uh, women's grassroots uh, agency uh, about solidarity as a most efficient survival strategy uh, in the Gulag and today as well. So um, for me, it's uh, just another opportunity um, to, uh, to think about the some very uh, uh, important um, gender peculiarities of women's experiences living through the extreme uh, times, extreme circumstances. And I'm trying somehow to find um, those uh, parallels in, in, in contemporary events. Although I really uh, don't feel I am prepared enough to, you know, to delve, to immerse myself in this uh, in this kind of research right now. Thank you. Anybody else? I I, I wanted again to thank you from the bottom of my heart for finding strength in you in you to come and talk about this work. As you've uh, pointed out, Marina, we have heard other voices, other brave souls sharing their experiences. Um, we need that in, in the West or outside of Ukraine, and we're deeply thankful for your ability to share your thoughts and opinions on, on how to forge forward when it comes to careful, ethically sound work, which we are, which you are to do while, while you are on the ground. Uh, with this being said, I would like us to imagine that this conversation is to be continued. We'll find a time, we'll find the right moment, to reconnect with our presenters and to readdress this, these and other related questions again. Thank you so much for your opinions, for your voices, for, uh, for thoughts on what to do next. And I want to thank those in the audience for sticking around with us for, for a longer period of time than planned. I wanted to thank the organizers, uh, first, uh, Kulu Folklo Centra, secondly, who's the lecturer of Ukrainian culture and ethnography. Also, Marina Chernyavska is the angel behind the wheels here who is hosting our events. We are also working on a number of other initiatives in this center, but all the partner institutions such as the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. I'm going to share in the chat with all, or maybe Marina Chernyavska will share with everybody, uh, the reference to another initiative we are involved in, and it is called Ukrainian Archives Rescue Team, where we are reaching out to our colleagues in Ukraine and asking them to identify those uh, archives, those researchers who are under threat, whose collections are under threat, and that they are um, willing to use an opportunity to upload and save their data with us. We will welcome that. We have the infrastructure on the ground to do that. And we're here to, to do what we can to assist our colleagues in Ukraine. Thank you very much yet again. I am looking forward to our next encounters. It's been always a joy to work with all of you in a room. And um, goodbye. Thank you very much. It was a great session. Thank you for organizing it. Very, very important now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Dear Thank you, every, every, everyone, for attention. Because uh, we are with Oksana in Ukraine, we hear a uh, siren in this moment and is, is really, really a war in our, our life. And you can see in the chat, my dear presenters, all the wonderful words which are being shared by everybody. People are sending their virtual hugs, thanks from all kinds of corners of the world. We had visitors from France, Belgium, I think Switzerland, um, of course, Ukraine, uh, Massachusetts, a few uh, folks from Harvard, but also from elsewhere, um, from all over the world. You made it, you made a huge impact on all of us here. I'm superbly thankful.